Hello, thank you very much for attending our webinar today on banking fraud and cybercrime prevention. My name is Mina Fornero and I'm the Digital Marketing Manager of NetGuardian. Uh, before we begin, I would like to just uh, remind you that your phones have been muted. And if you have questions during the webinar, please don't hesitate to use the chat feature so we can address the questions at the end of the webinar. We will try to address all the questions at the end. However, if there are any remaining questions because of time constraints, we will get back to you with, by email with our answers. And this webinar is recorded and it will be available along with the presentation slides. Now I would like to introduce you to our presenter today. Uh, this is Cedric Frezar. Uh, Cedric is a senior risk consultant at NetGuardians. He has more than 10 years of experience in audits and risk assessments. He has expert analysis in risk assessment and new anti-fault patterns. He's really providing um, banks with um, high value information on internal control, regulatory compliance, and anti-fault. And before joining NetGuardian, Cedric worked at uh, Ernst & Young Switzerland for several years as senior IT auditor. And last but not the least, very important, he's a pro golfer with a handicap of four. So now I let uh, Cedric continue with his presentation. Thank you very much, Mine. Oh, that puts a lot of pressure on me, right? So the, the topic for today is the latest trend in banking fraud and cybercrime prevention. The agenda of today is quite dense. Um, I will first present you with fraud, uh, fraud cases and trends, facts and figures. Um, present you some fraud cases, so real life fraud cases, internal and external. And bring you a view on the fraud prevention solutions that we can bring in order to combat fraud, whether it is internal or external. And then at the end, a short wrap-up and a Q&A session. So please feel free to ask any question that comes to mind uh, using the chat session. We'll answer every question at the end, as Mina said. First, let's, let me start with a story. Imagine a commercial bank in Switzerland, uh, in Geneva, uh, any bank that you can think of, uh, where you have Peter. Peter is a very loyal back office employee. He's working for the bank. He has been working for years. Uh, he's sitting at his desk doing his job. Uh, a quiet, lovely person. Uh, nothing really special about him. Uh, but his family is dreaming about a new house. Uh, their neighbors have bought new cars. And uh, he feels that with what he earns at the, at the bank, he will never be able to afford it to his family. So he's starting to think about other ways to earn money within the bank. He's a good friend with Monica. Uh, Monica used to work at uh, the, IT, the IT team within the bank. And during, um, during an evening uh, corporate event, uh, they drink some some wine together, start discussing, talking, and then uh, it's kind of easy to convince her to upgrade the access rights that he has on the core banking system that the bank is using. And using this uh, upgraded access rights, it's kind of easy for him to move some money from a dormant account, an inactive account, maybe someone who is deceased and the assets have not, have not been claimed by the family. So no one will notice anything because afterwards what Monica will do is just uh, put the access rights back to its place and no one, no one will, will notice anything, uh, especially the uh, audit at the end of the year where the access rights uh, will be reviewed. And since it hasn't moved, Seemingly, it's not going to be detected. There are several thousands or millions of Peters in every bank. Banking fraud cost an estimated $67 billion in 2014. Around three quarters was from internal 
sources, and most of it remains undetected. I'm going to, 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 to repeat these numbers again, $67 billion. Uh, that represents around, I would say, 5% of company revenues each year. And more than 20% uh, of cases represent an amount above a million dollars. And the problem is expected to grow. As you can see here, two trillion of dollars it's the cost of what cybercrime will cost to the banks in 2019. Uh, why is this number so high? It's because with the technology come new opportunities for banks to interact with a client, especially with mobile, uh, with mobile banking. And as you can see here, mobile banking users is forecast to double to nearly 2 billion users over the four next years. Uh, for instance, we have a client in Ghana, a bank in Ghana, and in 18 months, when they opened their mobile banking solution, they went from 4 million clients to 14 million clients in 18 months. Can you imagine uh, the impact on such a growth in such a short period of time? It means that uh, control environments must be adapted. It creates new opportunities, but it creates also new opportunities for fraudster uh, to uh, penetrate the bank and steal money from it. What can bank, banks do to fight fraud? Well, the first thing is to detect the fraud. Just to give you a number, another scary number, the average time that a bank needs to detect a fraud is 18 months. It means that one year and a half go through before the bank uh, detects that money has disappeared. As you can see on this slide, the most uh, important detection way is at the tip. So it's a whistleblower with more than 40%. Reporting hotlines have a substantial impact on that. Another really interesting figure on this slide is that, as you can see, external audits represent only 3%, 3 of uh, cases where fraud has been detected by external audits. It's slightly less than half than by accident. It means that you have two, more, uh, two times more chances to detect a fraud by accident than by using external audit. Coming back to the tips, uh, as you can see on this slide, uh, around half of the tips come from the inside also, so internal fraudsters are their colleagues, around 49%. The rest is customers, anonymous calls, or others, such as vendors, shareholders, or competitors. Of course, detection is not sufficient to fight fraud effectively, so banks decide to put some other measures in place. The most common ones are external audits, of financial statements. It's really the most common one with more than 80% of the banks having, uh, having that measure in place. On the other side of, uh, of the spectrum, uh, you can see that job rotation and mandatory vacation uh, and reward for whistleblowers are uh, less than respectively 20 and 10%. Uh, a point here is reward for whistleblowers. It's not really, it's really disregarded as a, as a measure because uh, it sets some trust issues between colleagues that are going to be uh, starting to look at each other suspiciously and break the trust that you can bring uh, 
inside your teeth. But are those measures, even if they are really widespread, are they really effective? On the next slide, we will show the popularity of the measure against its real effectiveness when it comes to fraud impact reduction. And surprisingly, you will see that external audit being the most common method is one of the least effective when it comes to fraud impact reduction with less than 40%, a little bit more than 30%. On the other side of the spectrum, again, uh, you will see that proactive data monitoring and proactive data analysis uh, shows a really high uh, percentage of reduction. So it means that 60% of the fraud impact is reduced using proactive data monitoring and analytics. What does it really bring, those proactive data monitoring analysis? It really gives you another view on the uh, fraud and how it happens. Here we have the 6C model. In order to commit a, um, a fraud, a fraudster will case it, so meaning you will test the feasibility of the fraud by inquiring potential targets, making small scale replicas, etc. Then he was going to commit the fraud, so execute it, including the preparation and the planning. Then he's going to conceal, so hide or delete any trace of the fraud. Then he's going to convert it to a, a, an advantage that is usable by the fraudster. For instance, he's going to go to an ATM and withdraw the money or cashing a check, etc. And what is left to the victim is really catch, so identifying the fraud, detect the fraud, and control, so define measure in order to avoid that such events ever happen again. So putting some internal controls in place. In this case, as, said, as stated here, it's too late. Frauds, fraud is already committed, cash is out of the bank. With proactive data analytics, you can see here that the victim has already a view on the case, on the commit, conceal, and convert cases. So you can act any time, even before the fraud is committing. For instance, on the case, I'm just going to talk about this one, uh, you will see that an employee is starting to get a little bit inquisitive, and instead of viewing his 20 client accounts he is used to see every day, he starts seeing uh, 200. So he's starting to see and if he can find some potential fraud targets. Let's dive into some examples of frauds that can happen. So, uh, once again, those frauds are uh, real-life cases that have been encountered by banks, uh, especially by our clients. <clears throat> We're going to talk about card fraud, external collusion, identity theft, and e-banking fraud. On the card fraud side, we have some Card present fraud, where a transaction is done in the physical business, so in stores, shops, or ATMs, using a counterfeit card, copied from an existing card, using, for instance, uh, card skimming on ATM, for instance. And you have some card not present frauds, uh, where the transactions are conducted online using the internet, uh, uh, for instance, e-commerce sites, uh, or over the phone when uh, the um, where the card is not present, so you you just give the information using either a form or a phone call. The details of the card here are used through phishing, so uh, very common method, malware such as Keylogger, or you can even even buy some details. Uh, of the credit cards over the dark web. Surprisingly, uh, the cost of a card number with all details about the card and the card owner, it is called a fools on the dark web, uh, dark web uh, cost around $30 for each card. So it's not that expensive to, 
gain access to uh, a credit card. Another case is um, external collusion. So for instance, you can have the same seller of your bank serving all the time the same client, even if um, other tellers are available. So he's going to sit down and wait until the teller he wants to talk, he wants to, talk to is available. Um, another case, uh, so the objective here is to bypass the uh, identity verification. Uh, it can, you know, get along with the teller, uh, get an acquaintance, even being a friend to him. So the controls that the teller is supposed to do will be uh, easily bypassed. Another interesting fraud case is the human resource infiltration. So it means that an accomplice uh, is uh, in the recruiting process, and then he will keep hiring uh, potential accomplices, other members of the fraud rings within the organization. It is a long um, time span uh, to, to do a fraud, but you can imagine the damages that uh, can result if you have several accomplices within uh, positions within your organization. Another one is uh, colluding, a loan officer colluding with an appraiser. Uh, so you can imagine an employee of your bank applying for a real estate loan under a false name. Uh, an appraiser, so an accomplice appraiser will submit an, inflate, an inflated appraisal on that property and the employee will take the funds, uh, make, look, make it look like the customer disappeared with uh, the money and then say, I don't know exactly what happened. That is very common uh, in some countries, this, uh, this use cases. Another one is identity theft. This is a big problem. Uh, you can really easily gain access to a victim detail using vi virus, what we call a social engineering, uh, for instance, through phishing again, or dumpster diving. So looking, looking through uh, people's rubbish will tell you incredibly high amounts of information on someone. Or for the mobile banking user, uh, you can do a s uh, SIM swap so you gain control over their accounts using a uh, duplicate of their uh, SIM card. What will uh, uh, an identity thief do in general? The first one, first thing to do is find some personal information and credentials, whether it is passwords or uh, other cases or, or other information. With this information, uh, you're going to be able to uh, gain access to official documents. So basically, uh, ask for a new ID or request a new password. And once you have access to this legitimate looking new ID or new passport, you can go to the bank and really take over the bank's account of your victim, so the person that you are, you are impersonating. Then you can, for instance, ask to uh, change the address of the, your victim to your own address, meaning that all of the mails are going to be sent to your uh, address instead of the victim's address. And then you can, for instance, request a new credit card or a new checkbook uh, and have it sent to your own address. And once you have that, you can simply deplete the victim's accounts. Uh, and he has uh, very few uh, ways of actions to, to fight what happened, uh, what happened to him. Those cases are really uh, scarring for, uh, for the people with uh, psychologically hard to uh, get back on your feet once your, your identity has been, has been stolen. Regarding another case, it's e-banking fraud. Uh, on these cases, uh, I'm going to, to 
go real quick on that, but uh, the idea is to obtain a customer account, um, uh, access data, use this information to transfer money to other accounts and withdraw funds. Now fraudster can bypass even the more the most sophisticated authentication method, such as well, one-time passwords, physical tokens, smart cards, using man-in-the-middle attacks. And then you can have some distant transactions, so from another country, uh, or an out-of-norm transaction behavior, where you can uh, understand that someone who has a low profile suddenly makes some high uh, amount transactions, that's where you're going to see that something is fish and maybe catch the process before it's too late. On the internal fraud uh, side, uh, just to let you know, we are organizing another webinar on spe specialized on internal fraud. But just to give you an insight, uh, we have some teller actions, staff accounts, activities, collusion between uh, in insiders, uh, use of IT users, uh, high privilege, and some dormant account manipulation. Some cases that can happen on the teller action is maybe make the uh, client enter a spin and redo the same transaction. Or a customer comes to your office, uh, to the desk, to do a deposit. The teller tells the customer that the printer is not working. Uh, the teller is not able to give him a receipt and the uh, teller just cashes the money for himself. One case in uh, Wells Fargo, it's in, it's in the media in the latest day, uh, enterprise-wide employees secretly created millions of unauthorized accounts and their customers were not aware of that situation. And then the uh, employees just kept moving money around the accounts freshly created to charge the clients with uh, uh, fees and commissions. On staff accounts, uh, those come from, uh, the, the vast majority of those cases come from our clients. Um, to put some pressure on their colleagues, before asking them if they can borrow money, some employees look at uh, the uh, balance account, uh, the account balance of their uh, colleagues and ask them if they can borrow them money. And if they say no, they say, no, come on, I know that you have money on your account. Uh, also, they use their, their staff accounts as a, as a fund outflow. So if they uh, put some money uh, from a dormant account on their own account, they can just get the money out really easily. And due to confidentiality requirements, those accounts have sometimes a looser uh, control environment. So they are not uh, watched as closely as, uh, let's say, a customer account. We have also some really interesting cases on uh, transaction inputs and validation. So two accomplices uh, colluding to bypass the 4A principle whether it is for straight fraud or also uh, by laziness. So everyone knows uh, the colleague's password so they can validate their own transaction without having to disrupt them or to win some time. And also some uh, collusion between IT and business users. So uh, as my story at the beginning, uh, granting unauthorized access rights and then delete them just after the fraud, uh, so no trace is kept of what happened. Also deleting some logs or uh, having to access directly a data for an account list to change, for instance, an account balance or a beneficiary detail on the payment. That happens really uh, often because there is not a lot of monitoring of IT users. Using social engineering skills, an IT support employee can, for instance, uh, use over-the-shoulder password theft or uh, ask directly an employee 
to give him uh, his password, saying, for instance, there is a problem on his computer. And the employee, most of the time, is going to give straightforward his password that the IT user can then use to uh, defraud the organization. Also, uh, they can abuse a privileged position where they have access to powerful generic accounts, you know, the admin account with a low security password, for instance, admin 12345 or something like that. And user activity is really difficult to follow and user accountability is difficult to enforce because if the password is easy to get, a lot of people can use it and then you don't have any access to uh, the real user who did the wrongdoing. Also, uh, using deletion of audit logs, uh, so you have no way to investigate and prosecute the wrongdoers. Some dormant account manipulation also, uh, so the employee rows through to find some targets, then the account is going to be reactivated and uh, the money is going to be transferred to an accomplice account. And then, for instance, it's going to be withdrawn to an ATM, so no trace is kept of what happened. What can we do to fight fraud in this terrible solution, in, in this terrible situation? So fraud prevention solution really relies on what I said, proactive data analytics technology. Using big data and holistic approach that are going to focus on the bank system as a whole. Uh, because transaction analytics uh, is not sufficient. It doesn't give you the full picture. And when you detect a fraud using transaction analytics, it's already too late. You have to rely on transaction, but also on the channel that are used and the IT layers that uh, support your whole system. And of course, the human come in the center because the fraud is always committed by, by a human. The idea is really to cover all users on all channels and the whole bank system from an infrastructure perspective. I'm going to give you a short uh, example of what we can do uh, with a data analytics solution. The first thing is that control automation is key. Uh, it ensures completeness instead of sampling, uh, consistency because human controls is prone to error, and it also gives you an early detection because it runs continuously and, and give you a real-time view on what happened. It also gives you real-time detection of unusual behaviors. So meaning, for instance, a customer connecting from an unusual connect, uh, location, sorry, and you can send notification directly to the customers of the bank. Investigation and forensic capabilities will give you a top-down approach uh, using dashboard, for instance, so you have a high-level view on risk, and then you can drill down uh, to investigate and really understand what happened using those powerful data analytics tools. Just to give you a short view on a concrete example, if I'm going to, to show you a short video showing that. Uh, it's an internal fraud, so it's the case of Peter and Monica that are colluding. As you can see on the dashboard, you see the top users in violation. So you can see that Peter is keeping breaching rules. Uh, we have some cases on the four eyes check violation that are uh, wrong. Let's click on Peter and understand what 
he has done. If we you consider only the transaction view, you will see that half a million with some commission uh, has been uh, processed. To understand really what happened, uh, you will go to the channel view. Because using channel view, you're going to see what happened in the application, within the application. And you can see that he has done the two inputs, so the transaction of half a million and the 75 commission fee. But he also authorized it directly through his profile, which normally is not authorized on a banking application. Using the layers view, you will understand what happened at the IT, from an IT perspective. And by searching Peter here, you're going to find all the data related to Peter accounts. And you will see that Monica uh, has, did, has done some, uh, something around uh, the user profile of Peter. And then you can drill down and see, for instance, that Monica has used a generic account called T24 Fraud. But you have the whole view of what happened really easily at the tip of your finger. Let's see another case of, internal, of external fraud using uh, e-banking. Directly from the dashboard, you will see that uh, some customers have suspicious transaction location. Let's focus on one. Let's focus on Han. Mr. Han, uh, we can see that normally he's processing uh, his transaction from Johannesburg. But we can see that some activity has happened in Lagos, in Nigeria. Directly from the dashboard, you can see that most of this was actually in Joburg. And here, you see the little red dot in Nigeria. Let's see what happened. This is the IP used by a potential fraudster uh, on Hans' account in Lagos. And you can see that he visited quite a uh, large number of pages on the e-banking account of Mr. Han. If we then try to be, get a big, bigger picture, we get rid of the filter on Han's account. And you can see that the same IP address has been used to target more victims, such as Terry, Mr. Sheffer, Tremblay, and Han. That gives you really the big picture of what happened from a fraud perspective. Let's go back to our point. So, sorry, wrong manipulation. There we go. Back to here. As a conclusion, what you really need to, 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 to keep in mind after this uh, webinar uh, is that fraud costs a lot of money, around 5% yearly. That the most common fraud measures have been proven inefficient by some, some studies. For instance, external audit is not a, uh, it's not a viable way to fight fraud. The only way to fight fraud uh, and have, have a real impact on, 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 on the fraud reduction is projected data analysis. And what a data analytics system should include is the following feature. So having a holistic approach, so 
consider the bank system as a whole and not concentrate, for instance, only on IT security on or, or on transaction uh, analytics, but really consider um, the, all the channels, all the layers uh, that your bank users and your customers are using to interact with the bank. It must also include automation of controls that run continuously to ensure that uh, there is not going to be an, uh, an event going through without being noticed. And of course, real-time detection of unusual behavior using, for instance, profiling or pattern-based uh, intelligence. If you want to have more information about what we've discussed and what have been talked today, uh, I really encourage you having a view on the resources that I uh, included at the end of this presentation. Regarding the upcoming webinars, uh, don't miss out. We have a series of webinars coming in in the few next weeks. Uh, the next one is on payment fraud. Uh, we're going to talk about the SWIFT hacking use case, and then we're going to talk about e-banking, and another one about insider threats at financial institutions. So please register, uh, register to, to these events, uh, and we are going to continue. About NetGuardians, uh, we are a Swiss fintech company. Our H headquarter is in Switzerland. We have offices in Singapore, Poland, and Kenya. Uh, our clients are worldwide in Europe, Africa, Middle East, and Asia. And we are recognized for intelligence banking for fraud and uh, risk assurance. We've been named Cool Vendor uh, last year by Gartner in category audit compliance and control solutions. And I thank you very much for your attention. We're going to have now a Q&A session. Uh, please feel free to ask your questions. Great. Thanks a lot, Cedric. I think this was real and insightful presentation. I hope uh, everyone found it very valuable. Just as uh, Cedric was mentioning, we will have further webinars on different types of uh, fraud cases. So then we will be able to really dig in how we mitigate these uh, fraud types that Cedric has presented with this webinar. So don't hesitate to register for the upcoming webinars where we can really dig in a specific type of fraud types and show how we mitigate um, fraud types with controlled automation. And this was also one of the questions that we have received. Thank you very much. And we have a few minutes left as well. We can take a few more questions. And one question is about um, bypassing e-banking authentication. So how can fraudsters bypass strong e-banking authentication methods, for example, tokens? Uh, what really happens from, from a hacker perspective is going to uh, use what we call a man-in-the-middle attack. So even if you authenticate uh, using a token, uh, the fraudster, using some uh, hacking techniques, uh, will uh, simply put himself in the middle, intercept the authentication method, tamper it, and then he's going to intercept uh, uh, the communication between your computer and the bank and modify what you sent to, to the bank. Or even before uh, you send it, because normally the channels are encrypted, is going to uh, be able to modify it live before you, you send it. Uh, and we, we can give you some, some more details if you want. But uh, clearly, that's normally how it works. So basically, you uh, intercept the message sent to the bank, modify it, and uh, resend it to the bank without anyone noticing it. Okay, thank you very much, Cedric. And we have also one more question about um, SIM swap. So could you explain a bit what is a SIM swap? Yes, it's a type of identity theft. It's very common in Africa. 
where clients use a lot of mo uh, the mobile banking features. What happens is uh, the fraudster goes to uh, to the to, to a mobile uh, phone shop, says, "Okay, my my." my phone died, my SIM card is broken, or it doesn't work anymore. And using a fake, uh, fake uh, ID, he's going to obtain a new uh, SIM card for a phone number. And using this fake SIM card, he's going to get access to uh, the bank account of the victim, because the authentication is done uh, through the mobile phone number. And as he has got access to this phone number, um, he's going to be able to gain access to the, the bank account of the victim and deplete it simply using this, uh, this mobile banking channel. Okay, we have another question. Um, I'm not sure. Okay, okay. We just covered it now with this uh, point as well. And um, I think this was Oh, let me just wait one more minute to see if they have a few more questions coming. Otherwise, we are fine. Okay, we have one more question, so we can take one last question. So it's about the uh, false positives, because it's a common issue that at the end, um, we might have, you might get a lot of false positives. How can we handle uh, with this problem and how the solution actually um, uh, dealing with false positives? Very good question. Actually, that's, a, that's one of the key points where uh, organization uh, kind of lose face in the data analytics uh, platform. Uh, can you imagine a system where it generates 10,000 uh, of alerts daily, you, you cannot manage that. So it means that you need to have a way of refining the controls that you use uh, in order to reduce the number of alerts and especially false positive alerts that you receive. One way of doing that is to uh, refine the control and having a way on your data analytics platform to rerun the controls once you've corrected it on historical data. Uh, and, and that's really what's lacking in most of the uh, data analytics platform is this uh, way of rerun the control on uh, data that kind of already have been controlled. Uh, so if you can rerun the controls on historical data, you can lower the uh, number of false positives that you uh, received and even catch frauds that you haven't caught in the first place because it was kind of drawn in, uh, um, in a big amount of uh, data that you would have to analyze again. Okay. I think, do you, would you like to add, elaborate further? No, I think we are, we are good. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. Thank you very much for the, for the good questions that you asked. Um, please feel free, if, if any other question comes to, to your mind after this webinar, please feel free to send them. Uh, please find our, uh, our information, contact information, uh, on, on the slide here that is here, so it's info at netguardians.ch. Uh, please visit our website. It's a, it's a, it's a very useful resource uh, to look any further into uh, uh, fraud risk and operational risk mitigation. Follow us on uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, and also Twitter. Uh, we try and keep uh, you updated on news. Uh, and once again, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot for joining us today. And we will be sending you this recording as well as the presentation slides uh, very soon. So I, we wish you a great day. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.